Okay, well, welcome everyone to the Technical Assistance Institute. Uh, on behalf of Donna Meltzer, uh, CEO of the National Association of Councils on Developmental Disabilities, and Cheryl Matney, our Director of Technical Assistance, uh, myself, Angela Castillo-Epps, um, we welcome you to our session on COVID 2.0. I'm very excited about the panel that we have today as well. Um, the panel that we had uh, last week on abuse and neglect um, just went beautifully, so very excited about uh, all the sessions we have for you. Um, so for today, just a little bit about how this session will go. We will have our panelists, and then afterward we'll have a quick question and answer with those panelists. Um, we would like to have the questions uh, for that directed for the panelists and for what they presented. So for our first uh, panelist today to open things up for us, we have Lisa Bothwell. Uh, Lisa is a program analyst in the Office of Policy Analysis and Development at the Administration for Community Living. She provides recommendations and develops health policies that promote independent living and incorporate disability rights and the rights of older adults. Uh, one of her areas of focus uh, includes the 1115 Medicaid waivers, um, effective communication and assistive technology. Uh, prior to this, uh, Elisa worked as a disability integration advisor in several different divisions of FEMA, um, over the course of six years and has deployed to over 15 different disasters. Uh, Lisa also has a background with uh, serving as a student attorney, focusing on Fair Housing Act and landlord-tenant racial and disability discrimination cases. So again, we're very pleased to have Lisa with us today to start off our session on COVID 2.0. So Lisa? Good afternoon. This is Lisa Bothwell. Thank you so much, Angela. Uh, and I'd also like to thank everyone for having me here today to talk about technology and technology in general is a great opportunity for people to have more support and access to healthcare in their community. So I will go ahead and get started with the first slide. Great. So I'd like to start with, as many of you know, last year we had Appendix K waivers, which were being used by the states to waive specific services or to waive certain parts of, pardon me, uh, Appendix K is available and able to be used during emergencies uh, to request amendments to 1915C waivers. So something to think about for future planning is that this is something that can be used in similar emergencies in the future. There were seven different states who included assistive technology in their Appendix K uh, checklist waiver form in their Appendix K request. Next slide, please. One thing to focus on with medical technology that I think uh, it can be very intrusive, and so it's crucial to integrate the person with the disability in the plan itself. This is what we mean when we say person-centered planning. For 1915C waivers, and 1915I waiver plan authorities really we're talking about how to involve the person with the disability in the process of uh, assessing their needs and being able to support them in their community life. The National Center for Advancing Person-Centered Practices and Services, or NCAPS, has been helping states and territories and tribes establish person-centered thinking and planning and practice. You can visit their website for more information at ncapps.acl.gov. 
That website also has a I have monthly webinars which are open to the public. Next slide, please. So this is tech, typically where you find accessible or uh, other technology, pardon me, accessible technology in the 1915C waivers. The state has the ability within reason to define what is included. And that technology should not be used to subsume or limit interaction with, with individuals or limit their community access and integration. Next slide, please. I was able to find this statistic from a previous presentation about remote support and remote monitoring. There are 22 states who offer that service. So there is an opportunity to use technology to monitor and, monitor and respond to a person's health and safety and other needs using live communication. And so the support person, uh, they can support a person to be more independent in their home. Some of these technologies include window sensors, motion sensors, automatic medication uh, dis, uh, disbursement or other monitoring of medical devices, video and other monitoring systems, etc. CMS has also mentioned the ability to uh, or the potential for states to provide and use this type of service for employment supports, um, uh, day programs, community navigation, community exploration, and peer-to-peer -peer supports. Next slide, please. Great, so this slide is about the American Rescue Plan Act, or ARPA. The, there was a director from the CMS State Medicare director letter, which is how states can receive temporary 10 percentage point increases to federal assistance programs, medical assistance programs, or FMAPs, provided through Section 9817 of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 for the purpose of enhancing, expanding, or strengthening home and community-based services. This applies to certain Medicaid HCBS services starting April 1st, 2021 through March 31st, 2022. And the states have until, let's see. March 21st, 2024 to expend the state fund portion of the uh, FMAP dollars uh, for that 10 percentage point increase specifically. So right now we are in the middle of a process for this where CMS has requested states provide initial expenditure, or excuse me, initial expense plans and a narrative within 30 days of the request, which was due June 14th. CMS also allowed states to request an exempt, uh, excuse me, a 30 day extension, which were due last week on July 12th. CMS has stated that they will review plans within 30 days of receipt and so currently they are looking at the state's websites and plans to see what those look like. And the requests that were submitted to CMS are being reviewed right now. Uh, that's what's in process at the moment. So we <clears throat> also received a request from Congress to increase funding for more permanent changes to the increases that we see here 
in funding. One thing that's nice about this Medicaid director's letter is that it seeks stakeholder input and ideas and feedback. I think it's really important to continue the conversation as we move forward with the HCBS expansion. There are two parts of that which I will be bringing up. The first is Appendix C, which talks about uh, state demonstrations during COVID based on need, and one in relation to assistive technology, including internet uh, initial startup costs, which were included in some state requests. There is also a desire for ensure that individuals in person-centered planning are able to continue that establishment of their own plans. Appendix D talks about HCBS capacity building for long-term services and supports, or LTSS, uh, in the rebalancing work and transition, including making investments in infrastructure to facilities that are involved in that are that there and pardon me those facilities involvement with electronic health records which was first established in the high tech act or h-i-t-e-c-h act the health information and technology for accommodation in clinical health or h-i-t-e-c-h which encourages providers to healthcare providers to set up electronic health records. And now what we're seeing happening with HCBS is trying to pull those, <clears throat> those health records into an interoperable system. One thing to keep in mind as you look at that for your state would be the continuation of interoperability and integrating that. There is testing for accessible technologies that needs to be included, for example, smartphones or internet that needs to be uh, looked at when setting up these services and uh, as well as the uh, initiation or startup fees. One more piece of information I'd like to provide here is the EBB or Emergency Broadband Benefit Program, which is an FCC program that provides a discount on broadband services and equipment and discounts for laptop, tablets, and desktop computers for eligible applicants. It is limited to <clears throat> one discount and one discount on the service itself, a, a monthly discount and one discount on a device for an eligible household member. You can see more of that at https colon slash slash getemergencybroadband.org. Next slide, please. Uh, actually, you can go one more slide ahead. Thank you. ACL has been gathering information from stakeholders, at which I am especially interested in looking at various research and statistics that's out there and what stakeholders are seeing happen in the realm of telehealth and telemedicine. So I included a general telehealth definition here on the slide. Some of what we've seen from persons with disabilities who have been using telehealth is challenges with including third-party providers in their in their services from providers, for example, sign language interpreters and captioners. We are seeing and hearing about 
HIPAA being used as an excuse to deny bringing in a third party, which then denies persons with disabilities access to telehealth. Uh, so platforms are being developed right now. And it's crucial that these platforms be developed with accessibility in mind and developed at the same time. The Department of Justice last year provided information and guidance on telehealth and telemedicine. They did a presentation on this during a telehealth hack series last year. Their, their presentation was unfortunately not recorded, but there is a PowerPoint slide. Their, their PowerPoint slides are available for reference. I've also included, uh, I actually don't see it here, but electronic information guidelines from the HHS Office of Civil Rights, uh, which is public use, if that's something that you would like to get more information about accessible technology and uh, information. I will now close that, the presentation and turn it back over to Angela. Thanks so much, Lisa, for all that great information. We will be, of course, following up with that and making sure that everyone has the slides um, so that you can uh, look up and learn even more about the great uh, programs that Lisa brought up. I did put some of them in the chat box for you, so you're more than welcome to copy and paste them out if you would like. Um, and just as a reminder, of course, we will have everything posted to the technical uh, uh, TA Institute page of the itachhelp.org website. Um, and you'll see information on that soon. Um, so thank you again, Lisa. And if I can now turn it over to the rest of our panel, um, we are first going to hear from uh, Kristen Harvey, the Executive Director of the Delaware um, Developmental Disability Council. Um, Kristen um, uh, has, has, is a dedicated advocate who is proud to work alongside people with disabilities and their families to promote civil rights, systems change, and capacity building. So I'm going to turn it over to Kristen to share her uh, COVID work with us. Thanks, Kristen. Thank you, Angela, so much. And good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here talking to my peers and colleagues today. Um, I do not have the PowerPoint, so you will just have to be me this entire time. But um, I look at this more as a type of conversation. Um, so 2020, what a year, um, the Delaware DDC faced a number of challenges as I know everyone did. Um, we also are always aware that we are the home state of the president of the United States. <laughs> so a lot changed in 2020. Um, there was a pandemic. And I took over as executive director two months before the pandemic hit. Um, we onboarded new staff. There was that whole strategic planning process thing that we had to go through. We had to figure out how to meet and conduct business, how to be sure that everyone had access, not just as reasonable accommodations, but did everyone have the same opportunity to have technology and access to take part in council business? And then, Last but certainly not least, how not to revert funds and how to pivot projects. So we are fortunate. We have the secret weapon. Uh, people with disabilities are the original innovators, right? So people with disabilities, <laughs> we're used to problem solving. We're used to blazing new trails. We're used to thinking outside of the box and finding a way where there's no way. So I am so proud of our council over this past year and the way that we were able to pivot and not revert any funds and build new partnerships, build new initiatives. Now, one of the things um, that I was most proud of was our strategic planning process. We hired a contractor who is Latina, Marcela Saborio of Fall Marketing. And Marcela filled two roles for us. Um, she was both the 
planner and coordinator of our strategic planning process, but she was also our cultural broker, which was something I learned from one of my fellow councils at the last NACBD conference in New Orleans. Marcella introduced us to the Delaware Hispanic Commission. We opened our eyes in a whole new way to, I'll just call it what it is, all the things we were doing wrong, <laughs> right? So um, you really do need someone who is familiar with the, the culture that you, that you are trying to reach out to. Um, it just isn't going to go as well any other way. Um, so we were able to pivot our strategic planning process um, and actually have more people involved than we ever have before. We had virtual town halls, a number of them. Um, four of them were conducted exclusively in Spanish, um, thanks to the partnership for with the Delaware Hispanic Commission we were able to reach more people. People trust the commission. So they said, hey, you know, DDC is doing this. They really want to hear from you. They want to build a plan that is responsive to you and to your needs. So that was just absolutely critical. Um, Marcella also helped us get on um, Latinx uh, television and radio. Our phones started ringing before we were even off the airwaves, <laughs> which facilitated, um, that, which necessitated us to um, have a dedicated language line and to take a look at all of our materials. Not only are, are our materials in plain language, but are they in Spanish and other languages as well. Um, the other project that we had to pivot we were planning a Disability Pride Day event, and Marcella was also the uh, contractor for that. And that was supposed to be an in-person event um, outside, right in front of our legislative hall with educational opportunities and all kinds of things. And COVID happened, right? So that was not happening. <clears throat> and it was the largest amount of funding that the council had ever put toward a project. So what do we do? <laughs> um, the council pivoted those funding, that, that funding, um, and instead we decided to do a disability pride documentary. So the documentary focuses on areas of life. It follows Delawareans with disabilities uh, through college, career, teen life, um, love, all different areas of life, and that will be aired on uh, our, all the major networks in Delaware starting next week on Monday the 26th, and then there will be a finished product as well. We were able to pivot the intent of the day, which was to educate, inform, and let people know, hey, it's not us and them, it's us. Everyone is us, right? We're, we're unique. We deserve respect. We need to be included in everything. But, and how do, we, how do we still stick to the intent of that? So we were able to pivot that, and I'm really proud of it, actually. <laughs> I can't wait for you guys to see it. Um, something else that happened, too, that was beneficial, I think, was a renewed and invigorated collaboration with our network partners. So at the University Centers for Excellence in Developmental Disability, um, our Protection and Advocacy Agency, we really joined forces together um, to take this thing head on. So um, we it's something that we did um, in response to COVID that I think I know will carry on beyond COVID is being a part of our state's public health medical ethics advisory board. So this showed us very clearly that there was a lack of understanding about the disability community among public health. So we sat at the table. This was very instrumental in helping them to understand 
how medical rationing and crisis standards of care would impact people with disabilities, vaccine allocation, um, things like vaccine site accessibility, um, both in terms of physical accessibility and materials and the importance of having interpreters on hand. All of these things were not on their radar. So I always like to say, once you know something, you can't unknow. Now they know. <laughs> now they know and we have a permanent seat at that table so that they know they can always turn to us for those types of, um, of questions. And with the University of Delaware Center for Disability Studies, which is our USAD, um, we used some of our grant funding flexibility to provide funding for the Delaware Assistive Technology Initiative to conduct um, outreach, assessment, training, and assistive technology for people with developmental disability who did not have access to that technology via any other means. In Delaware, we saw a lot of students, um, once COVID hit, students with disabilities who were at home and needed their assistive technology and the school was not giving them that assistive technology. Um, and they, they were not, this was not just a few people, this was, this was significant. So um, working with the Delaware Assistive Technology Initiative through our USED, we were able to match people with um, folks who can give them an assessment, folks who can um, begin with the end in mind. What is it that you want to do? And then working backwards from there to get them the assistive technology that they need. Also with our um, University of Delaware Center for Disability Studies partners, we also um, developed a training for healthcare providers because as Donna Meltzer always says, there's always a, seat, a silver lining. Um, I think the silver lining of the pandemic is that Healthcare disparities have been amplified and laid bare. There is no more denying that there is a problem. Um, and in response to that, the University of Delaware Center for Disability Studies, along with DDC, created a training for healthcare professionals that was actually presented at the Medical Society of Delaware at Grand Rounds. And we were able to secure continuing education units for physicians, nurses, OT, PT, et cetera. So now they know too that they can call on Delaware DDC to provide training resources. I see my colleague Emmanuel Jenkins is on. Emmanuel, <laughs> our newly promoted community resource officer. So Emmanuel, um, Emmanuel really helped DDC to up our game this pandemic year. Um, our outreach and education has been greater than ever. And um, so Emmanuel, just to give a couple of uh, shout outs to what he's helped the council start. Um, we began our Advocates of the Roundtable. That's a monthly meeting of people with disabilities service providers, um, everybody just kind of at the, at the round table talking about issues that are important to them. And the idea is everyone you meet knows something you don't. And if you don't get to meet them, you're never going to find that out. <laughs> service providers can't respond to a need that they don't, don't know exists. So um, that is an ongoing project. In addition, there's a complimentary podcast that Emmanuel will be uh, launching soon, also named Advocates of the Roundtable. So stay tuned on Spotify for that. Um, and then Emmanuel also launched um, a series called Let's Talk About It, where he sits down with Delawareans who know things that people should know. So he sat down with the treasurer to talk about ABLE accounts. We sat down with the elections commissioner to talk about voting and voting booth accessibility. Um, all of these were things that people need to know. Um, you can find those on our YouTube channel at DDC 
um, that Delaware.gov is our website, but it'll also take you to our YouTube channel and you can see all of Emmanuel's Let's Talk About It. We also really I have to say something that I think will stay too from COVID is this ability to meet via Zoom. Not just for our council, but for all of the partnerships that we have um, forged, which would not seem typical at all, for instance, with our state's emergency management agency, um, our designated state agency, which is safety and homeland security, um, so there can never be a conflict of interest. They now understand disability issues far greater and with a far greater depth than they did previously just from us showing up, being at the table, educating them. Um, we found most people want to do the right thing. They just need to know what the right thing is, right? And they can't know if we don't show up. So Zoom has been such a important tool for, for the RWR DDC. Additionally, um, it has really helped us to connect um, on a deeper level with our um, congressional delegation, as well as our legislators just down the street. Um, despite it being a pandemic year and all of these back, back and forth, you know, uh, all this chaos, um, we did have legislative triumphs. Um, the biggest one was finally, after decades of work, uh, 14C certificates are no more in Delaware. No more 14C certificates. That passed on the last day of legislative session. We would not have been able to be there in force. I don't, I really don't think we would have of it without Zoom. Without Zoom to truly get those people there. Um, our partners in policy making class, all of them showed up. They showed up at that Senate hearing to provide testimony. A lot of them didn't even know that 14C certificates were a thing. And it really gave them the opportunity to take a few minutes out of their day and go testify and see how, how, how empowering that was for themselves and how it does make a difference. And that victory is their victory. That victory is everyone's victory who showed up. Um, we also were able to, thank goodness, change the, the law with Senate Bill 94, um, which permanently makes Zoom an option for all boards, commissions, public bodies in Delaware. So that was a big, big win <laughs> and will help us to continue the good work that we started during COVID. Um, so the takeaways from, from things that will stay, right, after this, this year, which I still cannot believe we not only survived, but thrived. Um, we definitely have a better understanding of gaps, not just from um, seeing my two minute warning. <laughs> we definitely have a better understanding of the gaps, um, not just in the English speaking population of Delaware, but in the Latinx community. It keeps me awake at night, the things that those families told me, and they need to know that they're a part it's not us and them, it's us. We're all in this together. We really are. Um, it, we have built a lot of lasting relationships with people who now can't unknow the things that they know. Um, and we can't unknow the things that we know that they taught us. So for us, it has been a big silver lining, a big opportunity to think creatively to think outside the box and to reach people we've never reached before. So um, thank you for letting me talk a little bit about Delaware. And I can't wait to hear from my other EDs about what you're doing in your state. Thanks so much, Kristen. Thanks for sharing all those successes and um, sharing how those kind of partnerships and collaborations were, you know, are not only going to help uh, people with developmental disabilities and families throughout COVID, but beyond. 
um, for even more emergency situations and just to have such an awareness is wonderful. And thank you, um, please tell Marcella, thank you to her and to Emmanuel for all the engagement um, and making sure that uh, communities are being heard. So thank you for sharing that as well. So now I'd like to move on to uh, Beth Stalby, the um, Executive Director of the Texas uh, Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, Beth has dedicated uh, the past 20 years to improving the lives of people with developmental disabilities and older adults. Um, she has extensive experience working with DD councils and the national organization calls on her <laughs> plenty to support, to support uh, councils and to be a part of our activities. So it's wonderful to have you, Beth. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Angela, and hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and to share some of the work that our Texas Council has engaged in uh, as a result of COVID over the last couple of years, um, I or feels like more than two years. But uh, first, before um, I want before we begin with this particular slide, we um, conducted three different surveys, and I want to turn the microphone over to Mary Rochford, who is our communications coordinator and uh, led these efforts to collect the experiences of individuals uh, during COVID. Hi, thank you. So I'm Mary Rochford with the Texas Council for Developmental Disabilities. And when the COVID pandemic hit last spring, uh, TCDD, we jumped into action to immediately start surveying Texans with disabilities and their family members and also service providers to see how people with disabilities were being affected by the pandemic. Over the last year, we've conducted three surveys in all. So the first one was in spring of 2020 the second one was in summer 2020, and then this third one was this last March through April in spring 2021. And we have a lot of data here on the breakdown of those participants, but I'd like to jump to the next slide, which is going over the results so we can have some time here. Uh, so like I said, we've surveyed groups three times. We really see this as a snapshot of uh, Texans with disabilities, obviously this doesn't encompass all Texans with disabilities and their families, but it definitely gave us insight into how people were being affected. Uh, I've broken it down into four areas that we asked people about. So we looked, we asked respondents to look at how they were being affected in major areas of their life. And we also asked them to answer open-ended questions like tell your COVID story, what are you experiencing right now? Overall, uh, as you can see on this slide, the slide shows um, survey results in areas of healthcare, employment, special education, and isolation. Um, and we asked people, has your access to these things stayed the same, gotten better, or gotten worse? What these charts show is access to these areas being disrupt and disrupted or worsened. So with healthcare, as you can see at the very beginning of the pandemic, you know, 70% of people were saying that their access to healthcare is worsened. This has gotten gradually better over the last year, but we're still seeing, you know, this spring's 44% of respondents saying that their access to healthcare is worsened. And in responses, people were citing a lot of different uh, reasons for this. Obviously, they couldn't go and see their doctor, but we also had issues with telehealth services, being able to access it, and a lot of people responding that their insurance wasn't covering telehealth services. So we saw that sometimes they could access the healthcare, but then they were realizing they wouldn't be able to pay for it, and so they weren't taking that opportunity. And employment, again, we're seeing the same trend, and we'll see this across the board where things were really heightened for disruption at the beginning of the pandemic, gradually getting better over the last year, but still not as good as it was before. Um, so access to employment has definitely caused a lot of disruption for families. Um, we saw that as far as people getting laid off, but also respondents saying that they were concerned about being able to go back to employment, especially if that returned to being in person. Um, I 
recall a certain family, uh, a wife and her husband who both had disabilities were working in the school system and they, their employment involved going around to different school districts. And they were, the wife was writing in that she was very worried about their health if it, and when it returned to in person that they wouldn't feel safe doing so. That brings us to special education, which um, we've touched on already today, but we saw that people were coming across two issues with special education. One was parents feeling like IEPs weren't being reached through, um, through virtual learning. Um, there was a lot of people saying, you know, my son or daughter special education teacher is telling me kind of how to help guide my child, but I don't feel equipped for this and I'm having a lot of trouble. Um, but then on the flip side of that, a lot of parents were really concerned about school safety and preventative measures for making sure that their child who may be at risk um, not contract COVID. So it was kind of a double-edged sword, didn't know if they should, they should stay on virtual learning or try to go back in, to in-person studying. And then isolation was the next big thing that people were touching on, especially in their responses. Um, in the summer of 2020, 94% of respondents felt that their socialization had disrupted or worsened. Um, six months later, 84% responded that they felt that it was still disrupted or worsened. Uh, obviously, this is a universal thing that everyone experienced during 2020, which is all of a sudden being torn away from your normal social life. Um, but as of all of these areas, we have to look at how it impacts people with disabilities differently um, than somebody who doesn't have a disability. So for example, we had one mother writing in about her son and she wrote, his behavior has changed to being angry, throwing things, banging his head and doing things that might hurt himself or others. My son stopped doing such behaviors at the age of six. He's just not happy. And then another self-advocate wrote in, I find my social anxiety has worsened considerably. And so we're seeing that some people with disabilities might be further, their lives might be further disrupted by this impact of isolation that universally people are feeling, um, but is truly changing kind of the thread of their everyday life. So in all, what we've seen is that across the board, as we can expect, uh, people's lives were disrupted in pretty much every area of their life. And it impacted different families in different ways. Over the past year, it is getting gradually better and services are coming back, but we're really not seeing that services have returned to the level that they were at in 2019 and prior. So we still have a lot of work to do to make sure that these families and people with disabilities are able to access these pillars of their everyday lives. With that, I will take it back to Beth Salvi. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary, um, and for sharing the surveys. Um, again, we recognize that this is just a snapshot, uh, and it was uh, an online survey. We um, also offered for people to take the survey by telephone, uh, but we realize it's not everyone, but we really wanted to put some data um, behind some of the speculation about what was happening um, in our communities. And so uh, we have been uh, sharing this data with many of our decision makers, with our service providers, uh, and others who want to know more about what has happened and what is continuing to happen. Uh, so I also wanted to share um, a little bit of uh, best practices in terms of what our grantees have done over uh, the last 18 months. Uh, so like we were forced to do things in new ways, um, but we uh, really also them uh, throughout uh, the last year or more uh, how they have changed or how they have um, how they have 
modified or pivoted their projects uh, in response to some of the COVID restrictions. And so I just wanted to share a couple of examples with you all today. Uh, so when we talk about uh, the main changes, obviously, uh, like every other state, most things went virtual. Uh, and yes, our meetings went virtual, our training classes went virtual, uh, but we were most pleased to see the extent of things that folks were able to do online. So uh, we were able to have reading classes and job training. Uh, we have a book club program, um, our peer supporters. We had some art groups that were uh, meeting online. We had some school fitness programs that were meeting online. And so it was great to see uh, the range of activities that could be done virtually. Uh, we also had a project that was working with a uh, with a medical clinic uh, and doing some work with uh, dental exams. Uh, that particular grantee sent some kits home to individuals and families and then were able to connect online. And then they both had specific resources and tools that they needed uh, to be able to uh, work on some of the education around a dental visit. So uh, we were very pleased to see the creativity and the innovation that our grantees were able to uh, to demonstrate. Uh, we also saw um, an increased access to project activities uh, because of the virtual nature that allowed uh, flexibility. It reduced the cost to our individual participants. Uh, we really saw our participation in grant activities actually increase. Um, again, I think folks were looking for ways to feel engaged and connect. And so we saw those connections happening in new ways. Um, a couple of examples from our projects. Uh, we still have many large institutions in the state of Texas, uh, and we have some peer support projects uh, in those institutions. Uh, one of our grantees um, actually set up a technology library um, at some of these uh, facilities so that individuals could have more independence and be able to access devices, connect with their friends and families, participate in other events, and not have to rely 100% on the um, devices of the staff that were um, at these particular locations. Uh, we also saw a lot of our grantees uh, incorporate COVID safety information into their meetings and their trainings, and so that was a good way for folks to stay informed as we learned more about COVID. Uh, and then I mentioned uh, the project that involved some dental services. And so uh, we were ab able to expand our reach uh, and that grantee uh, partnered with some universities in other states who were interested in what they were doing. And now because that was virtual, they were able to uh, watch the interaction and are now discussing replicating that project in their state. So uh, there certainly continue to be barriers uh, related to our online uh, access. Uh, certainly people who are uh, do not have access to devices. Uh, there are certainly parts of our large state where internet is not available. Uh, and so that has been a challenge. Um, but we have, um, we have really tried to, again, continue to think creatively. Um, in terms of grants management, uh, our program match, um, again, as some of you I'm sure have experienced as well, uh, our program match is usually volunteer time or travel or office space or things like that. And so uh, we have provided a lot of technical assistance to our grantees uh, throughout uh, the last several months on how to meet their grant requirements um, in, in some new ways. So um, in addition to just the activities that went virtual, uh, for Texas in particular, we have really been pleased. Um, again, as was mentioned earlier, there are some silver linings to COVID, we believe. And for Texas, I think it was uh, really being able to expand and our audiences. We are an extremely large state that goes from very urban and highly populated to very rural. And so this virtual format has really expanded our audiences uh, to statewide reach and in some ways bringing in some other national partners as well. Um, the flexibility has increased our participation. And as we know, transportation uh, to events and around our communities is very difficult. And so having this virtual option has really given folks um, another way to engage uh, with us and in our activities. 
We have seen um, social isolation uh, reduced for those who have been participating. Uh, and we were also pleased to see, for example, in one of our youth programs, um, a, great, a greater amount of family involvement. Uh, so our uh, families were able to see exactly what their uh, loved one was participating in. And because they were in the same room, uh, they could uh, engage and participate as well. Uh, we did have um, a lot of additional work in our underserved counties. Um, and then another example that I'll share is even on our public policy side, uh, we had some lawmakers uh, who um, had greater engagement with some of our leadership and advocacy projects because they had an opportunity to present um, to participate virtually, which certainly made it more convenient. Uh, and uh, so there was some in greater interaction there. So um, again, these are just a few examples from Texas. I'm sure these are very similar to the activities that you have experienced in your own state. Uh, we certainly hope that some of these best practices will continue um, and that we can incorporate uh, the things that worked well moving forward. So thank you. Um, and I'll turn the microphone back over to Angela. Thanks so much, Mary and Beth, for your hard work. Um, thank you for making sure that people with developmental disabilities are included in data um, and such important data. Um, that's something that I know a lot of states still struggle with is that representation. So thank you so much for your work on that. I did put the link to the COVID stories in the chat box for everyone. I uh, would definitely check those out. And again, um, congratulations on reaching uh, so many different uh, communities and really using um, COVID as a way to make sure that we can use technology and we can connect uh, people across such a big state. So um, thank you for sharing all that. Um, I'd like to turn it over now to uh, Jeremy Norton Paul, who is the executive director of the Washington State Council. Um, Jeremy, um, uh, before coming an executive director, Jeremy served as the state director of employment and day services for the Tennessee Department of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities, uh, where he supported a network of providers, helped design innovative waiver changes, and chaired the governor's employment task force. So we are um, happy to have Jeremy with us today, and uh, I'll uh, turn it over to you, Jeremy. Thank you, Angela. And just to check, can you hear me okay? All right, great. We did a sound check earlier, but you never know what can happen with a microphone in those few minutes. So uh, thanks, Angela, for the kind introduction. Like she said, my name is Jeremy Norton Paul. I am the executive director of the Washington State Council. Uh, I've been in this position for about two years, and interestingly, most of that has been the pandemic. So that's been a really interesting experience, to say the least. I really appreciate having heard from Beth and Mary and Kristen and Lisa and others. Um, some of what I'm going to share with you uh, is either similar to or a segue from some of the perspectives they shared with you. Some of it might be a little unique to our experience. And I share these things with you not because we have it all figured out or because we were really intentional about doing all these things or it went perfectly as planned. In fact, most of these things we're only seeing and discovering after the fact, now that we're um, hopefully most of the way through the pandemic or at least in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so this is sort of like hindsight. It's looking back, uh, where are we now? Where did we come from? What are the, some of the things we wish we had known back then? And moving forward, what are some of the things uh, and opportunities we want to capitalize on? And I'm sure that a lot of this is going to resonate with most of the other states and territories around the country. So first, um, uh, some of these ideas I fit into a category called paradigm shift, reactive to proactive. I think uh, a lot of you will agree when I say that a lot of times our work feels reactive, especially when it comes to some of the state agencies we work with or other partners who, you know, aren't always thinking about disability issues when they need to be. Often we're fighting for a seat at the table or for them to even be aware that they need to be thinking about disability issues in the first place. And so often it feels very re reactive and the pandemic was no different. It became very clear right away that our Department of Health and other agencies had not really thought about how to collaborate with or communicate with the disability community in a crisis like that. And so one of the things that's come out of this, and I'm really hoping it sticks around, is we have like stronger than ever communication and collaboration with our Department of Health, not just with the council, but many other cross disability groups. We now have a monthly Department of Health disability consortium, I think we're calling it. 
And we're still trying to get our sea legs and figure out exactly what our structure is. But the fact is we have two plus hours every single month dedicated to uh, uh, multiple disability groups interacting with the Department of Health leadership, sharing about issues, getting input, having debates and discussions. And honestly, I wish that we had created that kind of space before the pandemic. But now that it's here, I hope it stays. And if you don't yet have something like that with your Department of Health in your state, now is the perfect time. It's really hard to say no to that kind of request, especially during a crisis like this. You've got the perfect excuse to ask for it and to advocate for it, uh, even once the pandemic is over. Sort of along those same lines, we also have set up a monthly group called the Disability Policy Consortium. Uh, what we were realizing is that there are lots of different disability groups. There are multiple policy advisors within the governor's office who each have different portfolios. And it, there was just a lot of miscommunication and missed opportunities. And so we got together one day and we said, hey, let's just pull us together once a month, super simple agenda, and just hear what are the policy advisors working on? What's on their horizon? What are the things that we're working on? What do we want them to know about? What do we need to get feedback on so that we can be more proactive about some of these issues and not as reactive? Those meetings have been expanded from 30 minutes to an hour because we were finding that they, they were so helpful and productive. So if you don't already have something like that, now is the perfect time to ask for it. Again, very hard to say no to a request like that, especially during a crisis. Um, I've also found that we've had um, richer and more regular conversations with our Medicaid state agency and our Developmental Disabilities Administration. Not to say that we weren't collaborating regularly before, but at the beginning of the pandemic, we set up weekly check-ins every single week, Tuesday mornings at 8.30 to talk about um, mostly COVID-related issues, but it has since evolved to talking about almost not really talking about COVID that much most of the time, um, talking about other things. And so that's another thing where I, we've, we've realized that having a regular check-in, and it's not just the council, we created um, space for the uh, Arc of Washington State, the Developmental Disabilities Ombuds Office, um, the Developmental Disabilities Administration, and the Healthcare Authority, which is our Medicaid agency. And so it's just become a really predictable, awesome space every single week to check in, touch base, uh, and know that we're going to be able to address those issues together. So overall, um, you know, now is the perfect time, if you haven't already, to be thinking about how to shift that approach from, react, from agencies reacting to issues and reacting to communications to being more proactive about how we're meeting and how we're communicating. Next slide, please. All right, I know that all of us are very, very familiar with this mantra, nothing about us without us, uh, which is that people who are most impacted by decisions and experiences um, in this context, uh, people with disabilities themselves and family members of people with disabilities uh, need to be involved in all discussions and all decisions that impact them. And that's always been true, but I think especially during this pandemic, it has come to a head and it's been illuminated. Uh, and we are realizing there are a lot of spaces where people have not been included in really important decisions. For example, uh, vaccine communication, vaccine rollout, um, all sorts of things related to COVID. People with disabilities themselves have not been included in any of the uh, deliberations or decisions leading up to the pandemic or at the beginning. And so now it became pain painfully obvious that that was the case. So now I think there's more of a focus than ever on um, getting more people engaged. I've seen more people than ever engaging in advocacy, especially with Zoom. It is easier than ever for someone to pick up their phone or pick up their tablet and get on the call with a governor's advisor or get on the call with the Department of Health or a legislator. Um, I've seen that policymakers are spending more time than ever with self-advocates, not through a filter of some other organization or some other person, but directly with self-advocates. For example, our um, we have a group of self-advocacy organizations that um, set up weekly, no, I'm sorry, bi-weekly phone calls with a, gov a governor's policy advisor. So every single two weeks, they get the chance to share their unfiltered, unvarnished opinions and perspectives and feedback on issues without worrying about people without disabilities um, filtering or changing what they say. And I think it's just been a phenomenal experience for them and also for the policy advisor who um, is getting exposed to so many more people and so many more perspectives than ever before. Uh, like I said, there's been just ongoing questions about who's here, who's still missing, especially because we don't have as much excuse about travel and, well, that person just couldn't get here today. Oh, well, the bus, it's too complicated for that person to get here. It's very simple for most people these days to join conversations and join meetings, so we have very little excuse 
Um, and so I've seen more, more than ever people are asking who's here and who's still missing. And of course, I have seen amazing resilience and adaptation for people learning how to use Zoom expertly. It's so awesome when I get on a, a Zoom call and everyone knows what they're doing. They know how to introduce themselves and mute and unmute. You know, occasionally we have issues or, or uh, Zoom bombers or things like that. But in general, people have become remarkably savvy in how to use these different platforms. Last slide, please. So I know that a lot of states are working on this, and I won't go into too much detail, but um, if you're not already thinking about this, I would encourage you to think about some of the waiver flexibilities that were enacted during COVID to, uh, to deal with the crisis and make sure that people could still be supported effectively, and think about which of those things have been working well, and which of those things we might want to keep around for a while. You know, some of the things may, are temporary, and that's understandable, but there are some things that aren't just for pandemics, but are just seem to be good, flexible options for people to have. Um, just for example, um, the, the increased FMAP rates, the federal medical assistance percentages, so the fact that provider agencies have been getting enhanced or increased reimbursement rates for their services has been great to make sure that they can uh, recruit staff and make, retain staff and pay them fair wages, especially with increased overtime during a pandemic. But what we're seeing, which is what we knew before, but needed a pandemic to emphasize it, is that that's that's just that should just be the normal amount of funding that they get to provide services, if not more. And so I think that we as advocates need to be thinking about making those enhanced rates the new norm. What can we do to make sure that providers are getting paid to do excellent work uh, to support people effectively and make sure that they're not having to just scrape by on a shoestring? I think telehealth and other virtual remote services uh, we heard from Lisa earlier about some of those remote support services. I think there's a huge push across the country uh, for people to continue having that flexibility, whether it's uh, some of their therapies or their employment services or their residential services. There is so much that can be provided virtually uh, or remotely. Um, not, and it doesn't work for all people in all situations, of course, but most people can benefit in some way from technology or other remote support. So we should be thinking about how to carry that forward after the pandemic ends. Um, and of course, you know, I'll just leave you with this note that I think some of this, some of these chips are still continuing to fall on the table, uh, but we have realized that there are so many issues in our current system, so many problems. Some of them we knew about, but some of them we had no idea. And this pandemic has highlighted them, and I think it will continue to highlight them for the foreseeable future. And so the best thing that we can do is, is make note of them and just and make sure that we're not missing an opportunity to fix things that are broken. So with that, I will uh, hand it back over to Angela. Thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Jeremy, for sharing those successes and for touching on the whole telehealth piece. Um, definitely something that uh, we're hoping moves forward to support uh, individuals and families. So thank you for sharing all that. Um, I would like to turn it over, last but not least, uh, to Vicki Davidson, the Executive Director of the Missouri Developmental Disabilities Council. Uh, Vicki has over 35 years of experience working towards statewide systems change and policy development uh, that impacts individuals with developmental disabilities and their families. Um, uh, Vicki has uh, extensive expertise in emergency preparedness and response for people with disabilities, and so we are very excited to hear about the work in Missouri. So, Vicki? Thank you so much, Angela, and uh, I'm really happy to be able to ser serve on this panel with uh, my distinguished colleagues uh, who are very talented and have done a lot of good work in their states. Next slide, please. The first slide in the presentation has to do with the COVID work group. The council uh, had some uh, work that they were doing. Uh, that we were doing around emergency preparedness, victimization, uh, also uh, leadership for uh, individuals with disabilities. And we thought that that really fit in with uh, the work of the COVID work group, which was established very early on in the pandemic. The council uh, really was flexible and were able to transfer a meeting to Zoom uh, quite quickly, uh, which is wonderful. We had to change our bylaws in order to, uh, or suspend our bylaws in order to be able to meet 
uh, electronically or virtually. The COVID work group was established and uh, initially COVID or council members were a part of that work group. We also added our DD network partners, not just uh, those that serve on our council as our DD network partners, but we brought in the director and other uh, key staff from our USED. We decided uh, to work with uh, to develop coffee with Catherine. Catherine uh, is our talented partners coordinator, and she has a lot of connections with families and individuals who have gone through the leadership training of partners. So the initial thing that uh, we did was she set up coffee with Catherine every other week where partners, and this later expanded to include any parent and any uh, self-advocate that wanted to participate to meet together and talk about what their lives were like with COVID and what were some of the gaps and barriers that they were seeing. Some of the things that came out of that, for instance, were uh, we learned that food insecurity uh, was really an issue early on for some individuals. Some had food stamps and they found that they were inadvertently kicked off. And the other partners picked up and um, really shared uh, if, if there was a partner who had uh, some farm animals, for instance, uh, cows and uh, chickens, and were able to share milk and eggs with other partners so that they uh, would have food. They also uh, identified the isolation and the stress, the schooling, just a lot of issues came out uh, of Coffee with Catherine, and this was a forum that uh, was guided by Catherine and uh, very successful. We are looking at carrying that on uh, in our next state plan as well. I'll talk a little bit about uh, the technology scholarship uh, that we did as well. Several people have mentioned how technology uh, has been really problematic for people with disabilities. So I'll share in a little bit about a, uh, a scholarship project that we did. We also felt that it was important for people with disabilities to have information uh, that they could use during the pandemic. I presented about COVID preparedness to the People First organization, and uh, that's our self-advocacy organization in Missouri. We also uh, had been working on guardianship and supported decision-making. And in our series of supported decision-making booklets, felt that it was really important to include supported decision-making during uh, any type of disaster. Uh, so we looked at preparedness. And we also looked at developing a booklet addressing COVID uh, preparedness because there are some differences with all hazards uh, than there is for COVID. We also worked with our uh, Department of Health and Senior Services. That's the public health lead in the state. And uh, we have done a lot of work with them, but uh, specifically we were able to, we got permission from SARTAC to use their plain language document to update it for Missouri uh, specific, update it with Missouri specific information so that we could share that guide also with individuals with disabilities. And uh, our DD network worked to ensure that the palliative care plan uh, guidance that was uh, on the Missouri Hospital Association website was not discriminatory against people with disabilities. We found that it was. Um, we worked with the managing attorney of protection and advocacy and the USED and provided different language that the Missouri Hospital Association could use to revise that palliative care guidance. We had actually received a call from the uh, protection and advocacy in South Carolina that South Carolina was using the guidance that Missouri had uh, dis dispersed throughout the state, 
and it was causing problems in South Carolina. So we really wanted to make sure that people with disabilities uh, weren't discriminated against because they have a disability and were not thought to have quality lives. So uh, when looking at who might uh, benefit from being on a ventilator, for instance, or getting uh, constant care, we wanted to make sure that people with disabilities uh, were not discriminated against and were able to get the care that they needed. Next slide, please. This is uh, the slide where I will expand more on the Technology Scholarship Project. Uh, our Deputy Director, uh, Emily, really led this project and uh, it was really important. We sent out uh, a notice that we were providing technology scholarships. And we wanted to do this because people with disabilities in the state were not connected. And we wanted to make sure that they didn't experience that uh, isolation or even when people are isolated, the victimization of individuals tends to increase. So we wanted to make sure that people uh, with disabilities had the technology that they needed. In addition, we wanted to make sure that families also had technology that they need. We would provide information about uh, the broadband efforts in Missouri, but also uh, would provide information about different companies uh, that were providing free or reduced internet services things like that, but this was focused on getting technology in the hands of uh, individuals with disabilities and their families. We were really cognizant that it's really difficult that if somebody doesn't have technology and we ourselves are working virtually, everything that we're doing is virtual, being able to reach out to those individuals that are not connected can be very difficult. So what we did was we did release this information virtually, but we connected with different organizations, including emergency responders, who were responding on the ground, making sure that uh, people had the food that they needed, uh, so on and so forth. So we asked that those partners that they distribute hard copies of the applications for the technology scholarship. And the map of Missouri you can see uh, down below shows where those scholarship applications came from. They were from all over the state. And we have almost uh, an equal rural and uh, urban breakdown when getting those scholarships or getting those applications for those scholarships as well. That was a really successful uh, program and this is something that uh, we decided that we really need to continue to address the digital divide in Missouri. Next slide please. And these are uh, some of the recipients of the uh, devices that would allow children to communicate with others or uh, to attend school virtually and uh, also allow individuals not to be isolated. But they, it also allowed individuals to have access to telehealth, which we also worked with uh, the DD service provider, uh, service system in Missouri to ensure that people were aware of the opportunity to take advantage of telehealth. And uh, we assisted with getting that information that this was a service that was available. Next slide, please. These are uh, the covers of the documents that I had mentioned earlier. The preparedness guide that focuses on supported decision making with your preparedness and also uh, the preparedness guide for COVID. And again, both of these were focused on supported decision making during an emergency as well as during COVID. And the third booklet uh, focuses on 
providing information on where people can get vaccinated, and also more uh, plain language information about what the virus is and how to protect yourself as well. Next slide, please. I, uh, we also uh, were able to bring in the Access and Functional Needs Committee. I serve as the chair for this committee. This is a committee that is supported by our State Emergency Management Agency. And we address uh, emergency preparedness in all phases of disaster, whether it's preparedness, mitigation, uh, response, or recovery, to ensure that the uh, disability voice is at the table. And generally, we usually had state agencies and one or two people from the independent living centers that would participate in the Access and Functional Needs Committee. However, when we went virtual, I uh, also invited the Governor's Faith-Based Partnership uh, and the Missouri Voluntary Organizations Active in Disaster because those are boots on the ground responders that were in their communities connecting with community members. And we wanted to make sure that we were all working hand in hand to make sure that uh, people were not experiencing unmet needs, but also providing information to these responders uh, about the needs of individuals with disabilities. So uh, we do meet virtually. And uh, since we have included other partners, we also invited the DD Network. Almost all of the independent living centers are uh, represented at the table. And uh, we have 22 independent living centers in Missouri. So at least uh, between 18 and 20 of those uh, independent living centers have been participating. Uh, we added people first assistive technology because of the need that people have during emergencies related to assistive technology. And again, uh, they are the experts, especially when we're looking at the digital divide. And also DD service providers, such as we have county boards in Missouri. We invited county boards. We invited uh, other service providers. We also uh, want to reach out and increase the diversity uh, of our work and the diversity of people that are at the table. So uh, we included Alliances, which is a, uh, an organization within our USED that addresses the needs of the Latinx community. And Project St. Louis uh, is currently addressing the vaccine hesitancy in the black community in the St. Louis area. So I've invited them to the table so that we can also learn from them how to better do our work. And of course, the Department of Health and Senior Services. This uh, pandemic is a public health emergency and it's really vital that public health is at the table. And Missouri was really fortunate. We are one of 12 states that uh, has been working with ASTO in order to get uh, a disability advocate at the table. So there is a disability advocate that is working directly uh, in the health department. And um, I actually used to run the health department's emergency response center. And public health doesn't always uh, know how to address the issues uh, or the needs of people with disabilities. So we're really glad that uh, we have this disability advocate on board now. And some of the issues that we have addressed are the food insecurity. Uh, we had Missouri Empower that is a group that looks at the poverty of individuals and uh, works to address the needs of people who are in poverty and uh, food insecurity is one of those issues. We worked to make sure that the responders on the ground as they were uh, setting up their drive-throughs where they would provide box, boxes of food to individuals, that they were aware that people with disabilities, not all of them have accessible transportation. 
So they worked uh, by providing that information, uh, they were able to work with the National Guard in order to take those food boxes directly to the homes of people who were not able to get out and do those drive-bys um, for the food, the food boxes. We uh, have also been addressing the digital divide and uh, transportation is key. We worked with the Department of Health and Senior Services. Uh, the council has done a lot of work with transportation and we developed this website called Mo Rides where we are uh, continuing to populate that website to make sure that people know where accessible, affordable transportation is. We connected people with uh, those that were able to get PPE to them. We were able to address legal issues such as the palliative care and ensuring that people with disabilities were not uh, segregated, put in a nursing home for some reason, or uh, were not booted out of their house because of uh, the pandemic. We addressed crisis counseling, also uh, looked at housing assistance and vaccination disparities and equitability. And we serve on the equitability vaccine committee of the Department of Health and Senior Services. Next slide, please. And some of these successes uh, that we have noticed are uh, those collaborations that we have been able to make. In emergency management, uh, they live by the four C's, and it really comes true even with councils. Those four C's are uh, coordination, collaboration, uh, cooperation, and uh, I have collaboration down. I always forget the fourth C. Uh, communication, that's, that's an important one. Uh, so we have been able to really expand uh, who we are able to connect with in order to ensure that the needs of individuals with disabilities are addressed. We have uh, strengthened our collaboration with Missouri Assistive Technology, and that will help us as we move forward with our work on assistive technology and uh, also bringing people with disabilities and their families to the table and make sure uh, that they are able to um, attend school or voice what their needs are and have those needs addressed. Working with the DD Service Agency on the telehealth implementation and uh, also addressing, again, the digital divide. We, uh, I will end, you can uh, read some of the other things that we've done, but uh, I will end with uh, something that is really exciting for me. Uh, I have promoted that people with disabilities should be at the table in all phases of emergency management. And we were participating and uh, providing technical assistance to the uh, City Readiness Initiative uh, organizations uh, in the state. So in St. Louis, they were having a what's called a pod exercise. This is a point of dispensing uh, where they are able to give out medications such as the uh, vaccine for COVID, but also flu uh, vaccines, uh, any type of uh, providing medical or uh, preventative uh, medication to individuals who go through the pod point of dispensing. And we are uh, glad that one of the county boards, one of the larger county boards took us up on our request that they participate in the exercises. So they participated in the pod exercise right before COVID and found that the public health agency really wasn't able to address the needs of people with disabilities where they had the pod set up. Uh, it was very difficult for people with wheelchairs to go through. Uh, they realized that some people needed some assistance with reading through uh, the information and might need some additional assistance to make sure that they weren't given the wrong uh, medication or antidote, whatever. So this county board decided that because of that exercise, they would work with their public health agency. And they are now 
uh, they now have established a closed pod where they are able to uh, work through and get between three and 5,000 people with disabilities, their family members, and their caregivers through the point of dispensing and uh, felt that this would be a great opportunity in order for them to uh, have a vaccine clinic or a closed pod so that people can get uh, the vaccination. So it is really exciting that if there is uh, another public health emergency, that between three and 5,000 people with disabilities uh, and families and caregivers are able to get uh, the care that they need. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end on this and turn it back to Angela. Thanks so much, Vicki, for all of your successes and for that for continuing uh, all that great work and emergency preparedness. Um, we, we appreciate hearing from all the panelists today, uh, all of the different strategies that they've used to um, support individuals and families and change systems and you know move waivers forward, uh, provide recommendations. It's just it's really inspiring uh, to hear all the different ways that councils are impacting the lives of people with IDD and, uh, and their families um, and how that impact is going to continue. So thank you again to our amazing panel. Just to, um, again, let everyone know uh, your resources are on the itechhelp.org website. Uh, if you're on the list for field notes, a TAI edition went out today and there's additional information in there for you. Um, always good stuff there to check on. Um, and then we will, of course, meet again on July 22nd, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, we have another excellent panel uh, kicking off with um, Tawara Good and Wendy Jones from the National Center for Cultural Competence. And we will have emerging practices um, presentations on DICLC, so that's diversity, inclusion, and cultural and linguistic competence. And some amazing folks from Cheryl Matney's uh, Systems Change Groups and all of that information will have new resources for you. So I know Cheryl and I are pretty excited about, um, about launching uh, our new resources in those topic areas and also um, sharing a little bit about how those groups uh, progressed and were able to support each other. So definitely looking forward to seeing you on the 22nd. And um, um, Cheryl, did you have anything to add? You know, um, this whole topic of COVID, I know that uh, particularly councils have really taken up and be, been very responsive to your citizens wherever you are, um, all across states and territories. And so your work does not go unnoticed. The administration is highly interested as I've been collecting um, stories from your CDC, what you're doing with your CDC vaccine money. Um, I continue to stay amazed at the level of work that you guys are doing and really the engagement and the, the meaningful way you're including people with developmental disabilities and their families in your work. And you guys, you know, are so creative and innovative in the way that you have been addressing the pandemic. Um, we do want to highlight and spotlight that. Um, every couple of days, I'm sending additional information up to the, um, the administration to further highlight the impact of your efforts. And, you know, I always get a note back saying, wow, this is amazing, you know. And so anytime you have something, I know that um, the other day, uh, Jermaine and Guam sent me uh, a YouTube link, and I was like, oh, you guys have to see this. Check this one out. Um, so uh, your work does not go unnoticed, and I think um, many times even, you know, you think about your councils, your staff, and your members, um, people who may not be joining us on these calls, make sure that they understand that we're celebrating the successes you guys have in whatever way you're making them. And just take a little minute. I know it's on a topic that's tough, but you can celebrate that success. As, as dire as the topic is, we do know that we're making a difference. Angela? Thank you so much, Cheryl, for that. And thank you so much for your time on this.